was part of a movement for equal education and access. Perhaps was a dreamer in that all men and women are created equal. In his dream, he saw the need to protect this little black boy from a fate all too clear for little black boys that don't stay in line. The principal called a meeting with my father and the white girl's parents. The parents wanted my blood and neck, perhaps, and they were not happy that their little girl got caught in the mouth by a little black boy or with the blood coagulated on her face and lips, but neither was I happy at being called a nigga. So we sat in the conundrum. In the end, the principal sided with his death. The fact that what I had done was not wrong. My parents had not taught me to hate. I did not call her the top derogatory name or any other thing I would come to know as an adult. Perhaps the principal had no choice if this social experiment was going to have an opportunity to work. The thing is, why am I not to believe there was a below the surface narrative by those who often control the narrative? Of someone whispering in the parent's ear, you know he can go missing. It happened before. Turn up in the river eaten by catfish. I would never know how close I came to being seen and sun up with my neck cracked in the Kelly Ingram bar, swinging from a makeshift wooden cross. I would go back to school the next day like nothing happened. That big ass elephant in the room that no one wanted to talk about, still present and accounted for. Race. The kids knew what happened, I knew what happened. Yet not one of the adults wanted to talk about it publicly or in the open. After that day, I didn't dodge any more rocks and didn't associate with the other kids in my class. I only wanted to get far away from this madness as humanly possible because it was evident these people were incapable of being human. I never saw the white girl again. Maybe her parents took her out of school I'm happy to how white folks was loving and caring about the fate of this little black boy in Jefferson County. One thing I am certain of, and I would love to confirm this years later, I am almost certain the little white girl never called anyone the N-word again in life. <laughs> Complicated, right? The next year, sixth grade, I was strolling into an all-black Catholic school planted directly in the hood, across from the tracks in Titusville. Titusville, if you know what part of Birmingham you're from. <laughs> and y'all know, who my Birmingham folks at? Okay, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the key word being all black. There would be bonding over stack hills and platforms, circular afros and braided cornrows. We would drown in each other, we would drown each other in our language, the way we said man and girl, and we didn't run from our own skin. As a matter of fact, we ran head first into it. We were in the cocoon of blackness and whiteness had invented birth to the other. They were the others now. And we called each other. I made them a black boy. It was all love. Learning early in life to take what was given and turn it into something valuable. I had left hell and returned back to a mythological paradise, if only for a moment. And yet, society would not care about the scars, the racial wounds, band-aided up while expecting me to forgive them who damn well knew what they were doing. Somebody had to pay for the racial scars that became the Peter Miller. I became the proverbial street hustler. And my goal was to get over on a system that systematically pulled the wool over my eyes, that there were entire dialogues I would not allow to participate in. So I justified my actions as living my truth. But my truth only proved to be a lie. A lie I constantly came upon no matter the road traveled. The road turned into the sea and I ended up drawn into a cyclone of confusion, spinning and spinning until I was spat inside that invisible empire known as prison, as property of the state, inmate 289128. 289-128, property of the state, or this malice thing never to be confused with justice. Nothing symbolic, okay? Dark is dark. Cage is cage. Hunter and hunter are both in the literal make beliefs and what else do not exist. A lie, nothing cryptic here. Okay, rape is rape, pray, must pray no minute in the future safe from quiet insertions of a shank and masking tape. Okay, nothing here infinite. Only time is constant to the merciful and the merciless. 
There are no allegories to hide the iron. He slid his wrist, meaning he slid his fucking wrist. Okay? There's a cell with one window. Just before day dawns, early demise magnifies a dull metal toilet with cool water cooling two can sodas. Each wall a slab of soft gray cinder block. No posters featuring eroticized women with an exclusive and black tail. Okay? The wall that slits the light does not reveal nothing new ever. The expose the changing same. Always a holy. One wonder offers a gateway. My face pressed against the window and time rules this empire. Okay? The mind held hostage by time. Mind and body conjoined twins. The other wall holds a frame. The frame holds a metal door to contain utter disbelief of the invisible walls of gray. Not like summer, but darkness, but darker. Yes, there's darkness, okay? And so, right here is where I want to acknowledge, I want to sort of talk about um, these roles in the life, these all sort of things that took me down various avenues in life led me to, to prison times, to being incarcerated in Hagerstown, Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, facing more time than what I can to sort of even think about. Um, after not thinking for myself and thinking and allowing other people or other ideas to sort of like populate my, my thinking and sort of get sucked up into the wrong ways of doing things, I found myself incarcerated. I found myself um, trying to figure out how I was going to make a life for myself. I didn't start writing until I got to be almost 40 years old, 38. So I, didn't, I wasn't in Birmingham, a little kid with a journal walking around trying to think I'm going to be a poet. I probably am the least likely dude in my youth book to be a writer, I promise you. But that's okay. You know what I'm saying? That is all right. Um, the thing about it is, um, when I got to prison, I realized how everyone else had controlled my narrative except me. And I made myself a promise that if I ever, would ever get another chance to sort of like a redo, but that wasn't going to happen. And so through a lot, of, a lot of intervention, a lot of miracles, as they say, a lot of people on their knees praying and all that good stuff, um, I was able to go back before the judge after five years, um, what they call a motion for reconsideration of my sentence. Um, my sentence was commuted. I was sent to a program in North Carolina for two years, right? And so during that time, I prepared I prepared for what I was going to do with my life. When I got back to Washington, D.C., I enrolled in college. I got my bachelor's. Um, I decided, I knew I wanted to write. I uh, went to a Furious Flower Conference, who, which is in honor of the, 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 the first African-American uh, poet. Anybody know who that is? No. Brooks. Well, yes. I mean, excuse me, Pulitzer Prize winner, I'm sorry. Uh, the first Pulitzer Prize winning uh, poet was one of them Brooks mm -hmm. for a Street of Bronze Bill in 1949. But anyway. I'm at this. I'm at this. I'm at this. Um, this conference and all of these writers, all of these legendary figures that I've read about. You know, Amiri Baraka, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Hakeem Booty, Donnell Lee, Lucille Clifton. The list goes on and on and on of writers, African American black writers who try to adequately express the condition from which African Americans come out of and deal with on a daily basis, right? See, one of the things when you fall in love with literature, you need to fall with something that looks like yourself. You can't fall, you, that's, that's key. I believe that. And so anytime I'm teaching my students, I want them to fall in love with something. I want them to fall with all the literature, but I want them to give them a reflection of themselves as well. It doesn't work in any way. I, I couldn't have come into writing starting with Shakespeare. I had to come somewhere else. I get all that stuff now. But I need, I need to have these models. And so I understood I wanted to write. I knew, I knew I wanted to, to be a writer, but you know, and so the, my journey took me from Washington, D.C. to Chicago State University where I got my Master's in Fire and Arts and Creative Writing. Um, and my, my thesis was my first book called The Definition of Place, which is a historical look at uh, Birmingham, Alabama from a period, from a period between 1912 and probably was 1973 or something like that. Um, and it begins with a shootout in the covered wagon in Gunnersville. Can't make it up, man. Um, and from there, I got my PhD at State University, SUNY Auburn. Um, PhD in English Creative Writing. My dissertation was Culture, Memory, and Trauma in the Black Radical Tradition, Distraction of the Moment, um, which produced my third book of poetry, which was Pitch Dark Anarchy, along with a couple other things. 
I got a job coming out of my PhD program at the University of New Haven. Ended up, I became the first tenured person. I don't know if I'm going to say this, but I got to say it because you know what? You got to know, you got to know what you can do. So I became the first tenured person in America that got seven dollars, right? So I got seven dollars in Vegas. It's not a game. So I had to do something in my life. There was no choice. There was no other choice. And so um, that's what that's 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 sort of my journey in terms of of that, right? And so every, every time I'm allowed the opportunity to speak, it's not nothing that I'm proud of, but I feel like I need to let you know that whatever that wherever your road takes you, it's not the end story. Like mm -hmm. don't let nobody else control your narrative. Exactly. You can take control of what it is that you want to do with yourself, right? You can definitely do that. So um, that we want to finish up right here. Y'all with me? Yes. yes. All right, now I ain't checking on y'all. <laughs> Housing Unit 3, C tier, cell 17 was nothing but a dark tomb. Sometimes when I gazed out my small rectangular window, fixated on the rolling green grass, insulating the prison yard, I had to admit my wholeheartedly my life is symbolic of failure. The first day I entered through the circular razor wire at Roxbury Correctional Facility, I began to see men who surrendered to time as if they were omnipotent. Not at holes where their faith, where their eyesight should have been, told me how a slow, meticulous death could decompose the body. And yet to tell you that I did not live in constant fear would be a lie. An inmate got smashed in the head with a television and died. Lockdown preceded the deed. For two weeks, I stayed confined to my six by nine cell. Forget about running laps around the old dirt track to take it the edge off. Forget about pumping iron in the weight pit to release tension. For two consecutive weeks, nothing moved except the benches flying outside of our windows. Freedom could have been one running swoop over the razor wire, except the guard in the rifle tower had a long scope gun and wanted nothing better than to squeeze the trigger. Bullet penetrating flesh, my body dangling like a rag doll, my breath expiring to a nothing sound. The first few months of my five years did, I relived still picture frames of my life, trying to understand what went wrong, trying to unearth the root cause of my current state. How did I really get into this cell? I know I rode a bluebird bus through the verdant hills of Maryland, but I mean, how did I come to reside inside a structure of concrete and iron? Raw and raws that people know exist but fail to acknowledge. Prison was designed by people who could care less if I was real or fiction. Because I had to wake up when they said wake up, sleep when they said sleep, and eat upon command, I lived in a dramatic creation of which I had no control. The same as before entering my exile. Prison became an extension of the prison I lived in for all those years. And because we all live in the cage, the inhabitants within the structure Adopted violence as their central motif, constructing a society within a society. There was a hierarchy with an invisible list of do's and don'ts, the most egregious offenses resulting in bodily harm and or death. Days blended into one long stretch of lockouts and lock ins. Language found books like Fathering Words, Convicted in the Womb, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, and Makes Me Want to Holler. Language that demanded I create my own language to break out of the prison I had constructed around myself. After awakening from the multi-year exile into and out of the erasure, I know now. It's the sleeping ones that place me to sleep. The authorship of my life narrative belongs to me. I refuse to step into a story in progress, one in which I can only be driven by what other people's dialogues determine. Again, point of view matters. As in, if I rise from this park bench, gravitate towards the Hudson River, I am able to stare straight through the bronze cutout man, up the slight incline to an horizon that sets on West 150th Street and Broadway. Any alteration of view allows for post-war tenements with uniform fire escapes on either side to bleed into the cutout space where bone and cartilage and blood should be. Rotating our uh, would-be lens 180 degrees, the newly formed view offers azaleas and dogwoods, presenting an alternative reality that could bring the bronze man alive. By walking away 
the bronze man is trying to say the only way not to be a protagonist in somebody else's melodrama is to control your own narrative. Be the author of your own journey. All right, y'all made it. How about that? <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you, thank you, thank all the students uh, for staying. I know some of you got classes and whatnot, but um, I want to I want to thank you, thank Dr. Bond once again for bringing me. And as are we going to be doing questions and answers? I know somebody got a question. We got to have one. Well, that's why I said it's complicated. I mean, I don't sit here, obviously, I don't sit here to, uh, to advocate a certain a violence in that way. But one of the things you have to understand the context of that piece, I was in third, I was in third or fourth grade, man. Kid. And, you know, kids do things when you become, when you become grown, you become responsible in a different way. But you make, a, you make an interesting point when you talk about violence. There's a wonderful uh, moment in the Black Power mixtape. You ever saw that? With your answer? Yeah. No, come on and enjoy the conversation right there. <laughs> but anyway, there's a one, there's a beautiful moment with Angela Davis when they're asking her about violence, and she's like, "What do you mean? I'm not going down my hill. What am I supposed to do?" So I don't know. if It becomes interesting, but I think that's that's something we have to talk about. At what point does one take? One does one defend oneself? You know, I think it comes. I think it really comes down to that point right there. At what point do you start to defend yourself um, and not want to be pushed around? So I think that's different for every person, and I think you, as a as, as a young person, you have to make you have to decide what that is for you. I know what it is for me, you know. But you know, it's a lot of things. I mean, but there's all, and I didn't really realize I was in that moment. It always takes us a long time to process what memory gives us. Um, but I couldn't have told you that that was the moment where I understood race and this thing. But over the time, I've come to look at that as a moment from which it's undeniable that it changed my whole view in my whole system of reality, right? Because before, I thought everybody was cool. Like, we run around playing football all the time, you know, like, yeah, yeah. No, we did something different. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it's for, it's for you to it's for you decide, but I think you're on the, on the quest to sort of figure that out and think, and think about those things, because you, it's a valid point. Thank you. Yep, yep. Years later, what's your relationship now with your hometown, Birmingham, Alabama? I love. That's the problem. I mean, everywhere I go, you see my everywhere I go, I put on my bow from Birmingham, Alabama. I don't play with that. It's not negotiable. I can be in New York. Well, I don't care about that stuff, man. I can be in New York, you know, call them Brooklyn, whatever. I'm Birmingham. Like, you know, so that's my relationship. So I love Birmingham in that way. So I come back a lot um, to visit my parents. Lucky to still have my parents here, and so you know, my sisters in Alabama. Um, so I come back a lot, and uh, I always try to give back in any, any, any way I can. But Birmingham is not a go you know, so it's just like, yeah. Um, I'm from Chicago, so I'm okay. interested in how, like, what part? That, huh? What part? South side. What about? Huh? What about? Wait, what? I say, where about? Oh, like, Rosa, Rosa, yeah. I said on what, um, 53rd and South Little. Oh, okay. That's, oh, East kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I went to Bay Shabazz, I don't know if you know Yeah, that's Hakeem Abdul, that's my guy, my, yeah. my mentor. Okay. What are you talking about? I have these, the, one of the practitioners of the black arts movement. Uh, that's Literally. why I was saying how, how Chicago, because I know where uh, I Because I went to Chicago State. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so he right talked over there. Right, he talked there. So he was one of my, <laughs> told him my, we had this side conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so she's talking about Hakeem who was Don L. Lee, who changed his name to Haki Mabuduli, who was one of what we call the practitioners of the black arts movement in sort of the, in the Midwest. You have Amir, Amir Baraka on um, the East Coast, but you have Don L., a young Don L. Lee, uh, who will go on to th start Third World Press, one of the, one of the, um, it's the second oldest um, press in the United, black owned press in the United States. Um, and he was my, 
he was my, t my mentor and my teacher at Chicago State. I took a class directly with the guy who was involved in, in the business. He talking about the Black Arts Movement one. Like, it was like five of us. And he held court every week. Yeah. I didn't miss a session. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, so I know Betty Shabazz very well. I, I, I entered the third world. Which, so, yeah. okay. okay, well, that's like my background okay. so as far as like, um, I know where Chicago has taken me, mm -hmm. and I guess it's just my base has always been black power, Afrocentric. No, Chicago is very Afrocentric. Yeah, I so think. I just wanted to see how they choose you, but you obviously just answered. No, I, I, I love it. Man, Chicago gave me everything I needed to go to get out of the world. Mm -hmm. And I still go back. I was just in Chicago State for the Gwendolyn Brooks uh, night, uh, celebration in November. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Chicago was great in terms of meeting a lot of writers and um, me finding myself as a as an academic, as a writer, have to write that. Because I came here to be. <laughs> well, we have to go on our own journey. Yeah. You know, depending on what that is. Yeah. And I knew for me, I wanted to go to an MFA program that comes that, that focuses on African American, um, the African American experience, which was hard to find in a graduate program that, that just does that. Yeah. And that was the sole reason I went. No other reason on. I could. I had a couple other places I could have gone, but I chose that place. For for that reason alone. So, but Chicago gave me a lot, and I still go back. My first, my first is no question. Like the way you were here. I know, I know. When I was looking to see, I was like, "Hi, you were here some years ago." Right. I tried to call her, but yeah, I couldn't catch him. Um, but I was like, because yeah, I want to ask him a couple questions about his experience here. But yeah, I did see that. It was on YouTube. Yeah. Oh yeah, right there. Sorry. Um, I see that you went to Howard. Yep. And you were talking about in your past, your experience. Um, at a white institution versus a black institution. Do you think that had any effect on your choosing education when you got out of prison? What do you mean? I mean, I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to figure what you took Like, me. when you were, when you went to the Catholic school, you kind of like described it as being. It was all black Catholic school. school. Right. right. And it was a better experience for right. you. Right. Well, how it, for me, was a different experience. I think I was just coming, we would come, we would love that, that generation now coming out of the civil rights, the parents from the civil rights struggle and the black power movements. And so we were sort of looking for freedom in a lot of different kind of ways and um, exploring our sort of youthfulness in that way. And, and I think I got involved with drugs as soon as I got to Howard. So I just did. But I, I mean, I, I dropped out my last year. I had 30, 30, 30 some credits up to go. So I was, I was a, I'm not trying to go into that whole life right there, but I was doing a whole lot of stuff I am. But I, it was a life, it was a 25-year journey with that. Uh, and me, if you read the book, you go into it, but I'm not going to go into it because I don't want to like glorify it. I'm not really into glorifying anything today. But I did make a lot of bad decisions. I started hustling, started selling drugs. I was all in the South. I was doing stuff in the Caribbean. I was everywhere. So I was trying to like just do all that. And ended up, you know, I, 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 I succumbed to the fate a lot of uh, people did in the 80s. Uh, and it ended up in incarceration. Um, but I will say this, you know, I was talking about this earlier. Um, as someone who's come out of uh, come out of my experience, um, it's kind of interesting because you know when I wanted, when I wanted to go back to Howard, I could not go back to Howard, and I'm in let me back in. So it, it cost my felonies. So I went to the University of Columbia and got my degree. Uh, when I got out, when I had my PhD. I, I had. I, I, I received what they call a distinguished, distinguished writer in residence at Central State, which is HBCU, right? And so, um, right before I was going to leave to go take that position, I get a letter from the provost saying that the job was rescinded, um, and it was because of my record. But you know, at that point, you know, I don't run from it. You can Google my name, and you can find like 20 pages of a whole lot of stuff. Like, I talk about it. it's one of the things I do. Um, but I said it to say, you know, some of the things that I've, some of the, a lot of the roadblocks that I've, yeah, that I've gone through have been in, prime, in black institutions. You know, I got to call it like it is. I don't care. You know, the dog is like, I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what it do. So it's interesting when you start talking about that because I don't, that other, you know, like I, don't, I don't get that problem most of the PWIs. But you guys have been great. How about that? <laughs> 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 I promise you. You guys have been wonderful. 
and it's not about any one thing. I'm just, I'm just bringing that to your attention. And like, it becomes real interesting about how does one negotiate? You know, you got to understand we are part of a, a problem.